Hello and welcome to the Decision Wise Engaging People podcast. My name is Charles Rogel and I'll be moderating our discussion today. I'm joined today by David Long, our VP of Assessment Services here at Decision Wise. Today we are going to be continuing to talk about our ongoing series uh, in terms of manager best practices. And so we're, we're trying to give advice to managers on how to better lead your teams. Today's subject is emotional intelligence. Uh, there's been a lot of research, discussion on this particular topic. We're going to give you the decision wise angle today, add in our research and our insights in terms of what we learned and how we measure and talk to leaders about this topic. So, Dave, to jump into this, I guess, do you want to kind of give us your definition, why it's important, some background here? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that we want to think about as we think about emotional intelligence is why is it important? That might be the first thing that we might want to consider before we think about what is it and how do we develop it. Yeah, I, I, I think we see this a lot with new managers where they've been promoted because they have had success in whatever individual role that they had. They have really strong technical skills. They were able to really work hard, get attention of leadership, and then ultimately get promoted. And I think when we think about emotional intelligence, we think about skills beyond the technical skills that got you promoted that will help you be successful once you've been promoted. Sure. So in other words, what got me here is not what's going to get me there once I've been promoted to a manager position. So emotional intelligence, I think, is kind of that underlying ingredient that really skilled managers have. To define it, I, I would probably lean on some of the research that's been done. And some of the original research that was done was around 1990, and it was done by John Meyer and Peter Salovey, one's from University of New Hampshire and the other's from Yale. But it was really popularized by Daniel Goleman. He wrote, I think, a number of books on it, and he's all over. If you look at HBR, he's got articles all over. And the way that they would have defined it, the emotional intelligence, and, and I'm going to simplify it a little bit for the purposes of this podcast, it would be the ability to recognize and manage emotions in both myself and in other people. So my ability to recognize and manage my own emotions and my ability to recognize the emotions of others and help them to manage that. So based on that definition, and, and Charles, in preparing for this yesterday, we kind of talked about, okay, managing emotions in others, that sounds a little bit like <laughs> manipulation, <laughs> right? That's not, I think, what we're talking about. And we'll see that as we get into this. But if we consider that that's sort of the underlying definition, then if you break it down to those small components, being aware of my own emotions and managing my own emotions and being aware of the emotions of other people and managing the emotions of other people, then really what you have is four separate skills that you can improve upon. Definitely. Yeah, and it sounds so simple, but it's very complicated. And it's one of those things I think we tend to, we can understand when people are angry or sad or upset about something, but other times it's hard to really understand, okay, are they committed? Do I have buy-in? Do they believe in what we're kind of striving for? So sometimes it gets a little bit more complicated and nuanced. So we've had a ton of experience, and you specifically, in terms of measuring emotional intelligence and a variety of different assessments with individuals, coaching leaders, debriefing leaders on these types of results. So tell us what you've learned, what you know, and what you think are some effective ways to measure this. So I think we've been down many different paths in trying to understand and measure emotional intelligence. And I would maybe put emotional intelligence measurement into maybe three different categories. One uh -huh. would be psychometric assessments that measure the skill, and then assessments that measure the perceived skill, Okay. and then 360 assessments. Right. So we'll, we'll, let's talk about each of those, because Meyer, Salovey, and Caruso, John Meyer and Peter Salovey, and then I think, I can't remember Caruso's first name off the top of my head, they developed an emotional intelligence test, which is skill-based. Yeah. It's a psychometric assessment. But essentially what it is, is, and if we think about what emotional intelligence is, it makes a lot of sense in terms of how they might measure it. What they did was they went out to a group of people who were kind of their control group, and they show them images and statements, words. I can't remember everything that's in the assessment. But they said, how do you react emotionally when you see, for example, this image? Yeah, That might be a, an image of a, of a stream or some rocks or something like that. How do you react emotionally to it? And then the people who are being evaluated on the test will answer the same questions. And the degree to which they agree with the control group, okay. they are given a higher score in emotional intelligence. 
So it's really an interesting approach, basically saying that the, the way I see the world aligns with the way other people see the world. And that's how we measure emotional intelligence. So it's an interesting approach, and we've certainly used that. And I think it's been a very helpful tool, especially since they break emotional intelligence down into those categories that I talked about at the very beginning, managing self and others and mm-hmm. both the emotions of myself and others and being aware of those things. The other two psychometric assessments that we have used would be the EJI and the Hogan Emotional Intelligence Assessment. EJI is the Emotional Judgment Inventory? Emotional Judgment Inventory, exactly right. So, And I like those ones because, again, they measure the, the core concepts of emotional intelligence. But the problem with them is that they tend to be more self evaluative. Okay. So if you're not self aware <laughs> and you go and judge yourself and say, Yeah, I'm great at all these skills related <laughs> to emotional intelligence, then the really the core of it, which is self awareness, is is missing from this, right? Like right. How do we evaluate your own self awareness other than me saying, Yeah, I'm a self aware person? Sure. Right? Everybody thinks they're self aware. Mm-hmm. So that's I, I like those assessments other than that. And so we've actually kind of tried to look for different ways to measure emotional intelligence. And at decision wise, the way that I think we prefer to do it is using a 360. Right. And the way we use a 360 would be to either measure the skills of emotional intelligence on the 360 directly, uh-huh. or to take the 360 and use it as just a self awareness assessment. Right. Because you're measuring a broad set of competencies and behaviors, mm-hmm. which gets to the self awareness piece, which is one component. Yeah, exactly. And and their competencies and behaviors, and really what we're looking for is emotional competencies and behaviors okay. when we're looking for emotional intelligence. But at least we get to some element of self-awareness because the core of the assessment and ultimately the report that you get from the assessment will be, here's how you rated yourself in these areas, mm-hmm. and here's how other people see you. Right Now, that could be your manager, that could be your peers, it could be your direct reports, but at the core of it is a, a comparison of how do I see myself versus how do other people see me? And what we've always discussed is kind of this level of leadership intelligence, which is kind of this alignment between your own perceptions and those of others. Right, exactly. Yeah, and, and the degree to which you're aligned, the, we would call that very self-aware. But there are some people that think they're way better at things than other people think they are. And there right. are some people that completely don't realize how good they are at things. Sell right? themselves short. Yeah, they sell themselves short, which you might argue is more of a sign of emotional intelligence than even alignment. Yeah, maybe a sense of humility or yeah, something. Yeah, that sense of hum- humility helps them to, to get past some of that. But So there's there's a couple of different ways we do it. So there's the comparison of self scores to other people's scores. And then we can measure the skills of emotional intelligence directly. So mm-hmm. for example, we might put into an assessment as a competency, emotional intelligence. And we would break that into behaviors that are related to those four skills that I talked about at the very beginning. So Mm -hmm. you might have a behavior that describes that this person demonstrates an awareness of their own emotions or moods. Mm -hmm. You might have a behavior that says that this person effectively regulates their moods depending on the situation. You might have something about empathy that they show empathy to others. They understand how other people feel. Yeah. And then you might have something about their ability to influence others through emotions or, or despite emotions or whatever, however you might want to say that. Yeah. So you put it all into that, or you could break down those individual elements of emotional intelligence into individual competencies Yeah. and really kind of deep dive on each one of those. So if you wanted, for example, to have a competency in a 360, you could say that self-awareness, its own competency. Mm-hmm. And then you might say things like demonstrates how his or her personal strengths and weaknesses, awareness. How, how are they coming across to others? How do their reactions to things impact other people, et cetera? And there's even other questions that we ask, like, you know, if you're open to feedback, how defensive mm-hmm. you get around feedback, no, do you create a safe space for others to kind of work in, you know, things like that? Yeah, definitely. I, I think the, all those are, are things that we can measure. And the key here is we're looking for skills related to emotional intelligence to really try to evaluate emotional intelligence. You know, if, if people are aware of their own, for example, we have a competency called business acumen yeah. or the ability just to understand the marketplace, Right. If they understand the marketplace and other people don't see that they understand that, we wouldn't necessarily say that lack of alignment would be related to emotional intelligence. So we're looking for the skills related to emotional intelligence. Some of the interpersonal skills. Yeah, exactly. Well, the ability to evaluate yourself and control yourself and the ability to evaluate other people's emotions and, and then ultimately 
not control, but help, help manage. manage those things. Right, exactly. right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and did you mention the derailleur on this one as well? Yeah, that's actually a really good point. One of the things that we use in our 360 is derailers or a measurement of derailers. Sure. If we were to define a derailleur, it would be kind of the other side of the positive competencies we measure throughout most of the assessment. Yeah. So a derailleur, for example, one of our derailers is volatility. So it's negatively framed. We can put a little description of what does it mean to be volatile. And we let people say, you know, do I show up as volatile very often? Or do I show up as aloof? Or do I show up as arrogant? And this is really helping us with self-awareness and helping us understand, is there anything anywhere where I'm going too far, where I'm showing up negatively, where my emotions are, are going too far, where they're negatively impacting other people? So let me ask you, as you've used these assessments and, and debriefed, you know, hundreds of leaders on, on their results, what kind of tendencies have you seen? What kind of awareness does it create? What kind of aha moments, mm -hmm. you know, have leaders felt as a result? You know, I think in coaching, the biggest thing that you see is the increased self-awareness. And it, to me, that's at the foundation and the core of this. If I can be aware of my own emotions and, and how they're impacting other people. Right then I think that that's what we see a lot of the time in coaching. And, and we ask simple questions to get there. How do you think that this impacted other people? How did it impact you? What was your reaction to that? How did you feel after you did that? So we see a lot of that development in coaching with self-awareness. But as you work with somebody over time, they're able to kind of put into practice some of the other skills related to understanding the emotions of others and then helping to, to manage people through that. You know, one thing I was going to add, I just thought about is the, the 360 itself is an exercise in the self-awareness of your own emotions, right? Because yeah. you get feedback. There's always misalignment between your perceptions and, and someone else on something in the report. And a lot of times that sets you off in a way where you feel like, you know, you react, you're that Sarah model, shock, anger, fear, and resistance, and then finally acceptance. I think part of the exercise is helping people say, what stage are you in, right? Yeah. What emotion are you feeling right now? How do you feel, you know, did you process this already? And so as you're able to recognize, or as people are able to, in the heat of the moment, recognize, I'm angry. Why am I angry? Oh, it's this result. Why is this ticking me off? Okay, well, yeah. it's this and this. And so, so you kind of step through that, and that helps. That, that exercise itself is an emotional ex intelligence exercise. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about that is because you're describing reactions to the feedback that you're getting on the 360 itself. I think that that's such a helpful thing for people to kind of step back. And, and if we can name it and point at it and say, you're reacting, you're surprised, uh -huh. therefore this is resulting in a little bit of anger yep. and maybe a little bit of resistance, et cetera, then they can say, okay, that's what it is. But also to understand that that's a normal emotion that people have right, and you're yeah. aligned with other people uh -huh. in that. Yeah, is, don't is deny yourself it either. Exactly, yeah. right, exactly. Good. Anything else to add about the assessment piece then? No, I don't think so. I think organizations try a lot of things. I, I actually just got an email the other day from a friend asking, what's the best way to measure emotional intelligence. And uh, I, I told her, I gave her the rundown of all the psychometric assessments. But at the end of the day, the way that I think I'm starting to prefer is just using 360 assessments in order to do it. Because yeah. I think it gives us the best view, not only of how I might evaluate myself or how the test might evaluate me, but how other people are evaluating me. And at the end of the day, that's what emotional intelligence is all about. How am I building my relationships with other people? Yeah, and it, and it really gets to the behaviors you want to work on, too, that are actionable, as opposed exactly. to just the awareness around those concepts. It helps me to break down the individual components of this. And if I can break down the individual components, then I can address the individual components rather than just saying, I've got to be more emotionally intelligent. If you can imagine the difference between in emotional intelligence, we sometimes call EQ. Yeah emotional quotient, which is, you know, kind of the emotional equivalent to IQ, yep. intelligence quote, quotient. Imagine if someone said to you, hey, improve your intelligence. How do you break that down? What do you mean intelligence? Mm -hmm. The nice thing about emotional intelligence is that it's not just one thing. It's a, a variety of different skills and you can work on a variety of different skills. Yep. All right. So let's transition then and talk more about what to do, how to improve and develop emotional intelligence. Okay. Uh, so I really just started that discussion just a second ago. As I said, first of all, let's not look at it as one thing. Mm -hmm. Let's not just look at it as emotional intelligence. Don't set out to improve your emotional intelligence. Set out to improve the skills related to emotional intelligence. Yeah. So because we're breaking it down into individual skills, we might look at, for example, empathy as one of the skills that you need to work on. And how you might approach working on empathy 
would be different than how you would approach working on something like managing conflict mm -hmm. or learning to coach or mentor someone else. So we have to look at kind of the skills related to emotional intelligence in order to say, let's break it down into these individual areas. And that's where a 360 and some of these psychometric assessments are really helpful. If you can understand where you're deficient, then you can work on that specific area. Right. You don't have to work on the whole thing. You just work on that specific area and you try to improve it. So how I might, for example, and, and, and the way I might break this down, again, is to into those four categories. How am I aware of myself and manage myself mm -hmm. and my own emotions? And then how am I aware of the emotions of others? And how can I help to manage the emotions of other people? So looking at myself, I might, a, a, a really good step would be to take a 360 and understand how am I seeing myself versus how are other people seeing me so I can at least have a baseline for am I aligned with other people on how I view myself? Yeah. Second thing would be when I'm getting into emotionally charged situations, what am I monitoring? Can I monitor how I'm reacting to those situations? Yeah. And then to kind of understand the difference between reacting and responding. Reaction is something that happens in the second, in the minute, and you just it just sort of happens immediately based on whatever emotional gut response that you have. Mm -hmm. Responding, in my view, and the way that I would, would define it for the purposes of this discussion would be to take a minute and think, okay, this is what happened, evaluate the facts, and then actually respond deliberately rather than just reacting with whatever emotional response that you might have. Yeah. So reacting might be you type up the email, but you don't send it. You wait the next day and you <laughs> yeah. respond more 100%, effectively. <laughs> yeah. Boy, reactionary emails. We could do a whole podcast on that <laughs> right. for sure. But yeah, you kind of sleep on it. And the next day you say, what was I thinking? Uh -huh. Right? Because your reaction does not always align how, how you might respond to something. So taking a minute to make sure that you're responding rather than reacting, I think is a really important thing when talking about managing yourself. Yeah. And I think this comes up on 360s. We'll see people tend to be a little bit more volatile in certain situations and it's not all the time but anytime you are volatile or you lose your temper or you get upset it does kind of make an imprint on people yeah. right and it, and there's and then you have to repair that you know and, right. and so you, you created kind of a problem that takes a while to kind of overcome so if you're able to kind of pause in yeah. that moment and say okay i'm upset hold on let me be careful about what i say here yeah. <laughs> it's almost certain if you feel yourself being angry uh -huh. that you're going to do something that that you're going to think i you, should have done something else yeah you'll regret you might later. regret it later, right <laughs> No kidding. Yeah. So that's, uh, I think that's a really good point. And, you know, I think I love what you said, which is you create an impression on other people about you based on your reactions in those emotionally charged moments and how people that ultimately the image that other people have of you is defined by anecdotes. And those anecdotes mm -hmm. are the ones that are happening in the most extreme moments. Yep. And so your ability to handle those extreme moments emotionally can really impact the way other people view you. So I think that's an outstanding point. The other side to this, of course, is that we need to not just understand and manage ourselves, but we need to be able to understand and manage other people. And that's really where we're jumping from individual contributor to manager. We need to be able to get, despite how other people feel, or maybe because of how other people feel, we need to be able to get more out of the people that report to us if we're a manager. So some of the individual parts of that, understanding other people's emotions, practice empathy, Practice active listening, pay attention to verbal tone, facial expressions, those sorts of nonverbal cues mm -hmm. is a really important skill to practice as you are moving into management and moving into understanding other people. But also, uh, you know, with active listening, it's the ability to listen completely and then formulate a response rather than, again, reacting in the middle of what somebody's saying. Yeah, trying to think ahead. Uh, right, trying to think ahead say. and say, say, what's the next thing I'm going to say? Really try to understand what other people are saying before you respond. And this is just something that you can practice. I mean, you can be very deliberate about practicing it. You can go into a, a meeting that you have with, with one of your direct reports and think, I'm just going to sit in this meeting and I'm going to listen. And the only responses I'm going to have will be restating what their concerns are and what yeah. their thoughts are. I and mean, I'm going to ask questions to try to clarify and understand. And really, that's how I'm going to lead this discussion. So you can really practice that sort of thing on a day-to-day -day basis and, and really try to become really good at that. I think sometimes, you know, it's the peel the onion metaphor where you're saying sometimes people come to you with a with a problem and they're getting real emotional, upset over something. They're saying, this doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Why are they so upset? So you say, well, what's really bothering you? Mm -hmm. Like, you seem really upset about this. 
but this seems to be the tip of the iceberg. What else is going on, you know? And so the more you can kind of understand and yeah. get them to talk about the real issue, it helps to kind of deflate maybe some of the emotion they're feeling. Charles, one of our former colleagues used to say, if you are reacting completely different to a situation than another person is reacting, uh-huh. and we assume that other person is a rational human being, <laughs> right? then we might ask the question, what is obvious about this situation to you that's not obvious about the situation yeah. to me? Right. And that that's a helpful exercise to say, OK, wait a second. They're reacting in a completely different way than I would. And assuming they're rational, there's something that's obvious here that I'm missing. The, the next really skill that beyond being able to understand the emotions of others would be then to be able to manage other people or, or manage the emotions of other people. And so some of the skills related to that would be being able to coach or mentor other people, conflict management. And all of those things, I think, can be skills you could take one at a time and sort of develop one at a time. But for example, in coaching and mentoring and really in in conflict management, a lot of that depends on your ability to ask the right questions at the right time. Mm -hmm. Those are thought-provoking questions. Those are questions that will help people understand their own emotions so that they can respond appropriately. But ultimately, a really skilled manager and somebody who's really skilled in emotional intelligence will be able to ask questions that help people draw the correct conclusions in whatever situation that you're in. So if you can get other people to kind of respond and, and sort, sort of solve the problem, then they're bought into the solution. Yeah. And your ability to motivate them in that direction is irrelevant. They're motivated themselves. They've come up with the, the solution themselves. Yeah, because the, a lot of times we, we avoid conflict. We don't like it. It's uncomfortable. And you can help diffuse it. But sometimes you'll also see people that are just kind of defensive in a group discussion that just kind of shut down. Mm-hmm. And you say, okay, I'm going to stop pushing here. Maybe we'll talk offline. So it's always okay to kind of press the pause button yeah. to try to you know, relieve the emotion a bit, to kind of take the emotion out of the situation and revisit later. Right. Well, Dave, this has been wonderful. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today on our podcast. We look forward to having you join us on a future one. Again, we have a whole series of these topics that we're rolling out on best practices in terms of leadership. Again, thanks for joining us and have a great day.